And just to show it's not my interpretation, this is, this is what the Harvard Chain School of Public Health, this is their release. Public release, a media statement. And it says low-fat diets are not the most effective in long-term weight loss. And they say despite the pervasive dogma, and that's really funny because they have, they've been crucial in developing the dogma. So despite the pervasive dogma, i.e. the convention that one needs to cut fat from their diet in order to lose weight, the existing evidence does not support low-fat diets over other dietary interventions for long-term weight loss. In fact, we did not find evidence that is particularly supportive of any specific proportion of calories from fat for meaningful long-term weight loss. And that may be true, but I would argue that maybe there are not enough studies in which the, the fat has been raised high enough to produce an outcome. So, but how would this be interpreted? You see, this, people will say, they'll, how will they try to market it? Oh, well, all diets are the same. But, but that's fine. But then we've got to say, get away from the convention that there's one diet which is low fat is the best. And I don't mind then if we say for the time being that they're all equal, that's fine. But then we must talk like that. But, but the overriding point is that the convention has not been proven. And the convention, I argue, was never proven. It was based on an absence of evidence, not on the presence of evidence. So at the same month earlier uh, last year, middle of last year, this, that study compared normal healthy people. This one looked at dietary interventions for overweight and obese adults. Now they compared the low carbohydrate and low fat diets. Again, it's a meta-analysis and it antedates the Stellenbosch meta-analysis. And what did they conclude? They conclude that this trial level meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials comparing low carbohydrate with low fat diets in strictly adhering populations. Is that critical because the population is much here? demonstrate that each diet was associated with significant weight loss and reduction in predicted risk of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease events. That's arterial disease causing, causing heart disease. However, and this is a point I emphasize by showing you the fabulous work of Jeff Volek and Gerald Raven, that there are specific benefits to the low carbohydrate diet. However, low-carbohydrate diet was associated with modest but significantly greater improvements in weight loss and predicted ASCVD risk in studies from 8 weeks to 24 months in duration. Now, 24 months is considered as the length that you can do these clinical trials. And if at 24 months there's a difference, then we say, well, that's a long-term study. And, and, and you know, I get frustrated with, well, it's only 24 months. Does that mean that 24 months in one day that the study is no longer valid? Surely, if, it's, if you've been stable for 24 months, you're going to be stable for further periods. So these results suggest that future evaluation of dietary guidelines should consider low-carbohydrate diets as effective and safe interventions. Safe. And this, this hearing is to do with the safety of this diet as well. For weight management in the overweight and obese, although long-term effects require further investigation, of course they do. But we need long-term studies of the effects of the high-carbohydrate diet. Really, this reanalysis of, of the, the dietary guidelines and what we should be eating starts with Gary Tobbs, who writes these two books in, in 19, sorry, 2007 and more recently about 2012. And the reason I show them because we did discover some of the chapters and these should be prescribed readings for anyone who's interested in nutrition and particularly nutritionists and dietitians. This would be the first book they're handed as they walk into to take up their degree course. And it should be handed to doctors as well. These are two remarkable books which look at the history of nutrition and where we got it wrong and why we got it wrong and how we need to change it. They are just, he's a, the problem is that he's written off as a journalist, but actually he had no axe to grind when he started. He d had no idea what was right, and he just wrote the books, and that's what he found. And he, he told me that it's only because of the internet that he could do this research, because he can sit at home and he can get all these books and all these articles. And that's a really important point, that the internet <coughs> is breaking down who's got the knowledge. If I was to ask who's the most knowledgeable person in the world on low-carbohydrate, the science of low-carbohydrate eating, that's the man. He's not a doctor. 
He's not a dietitian. He has a PhD in something else. And that's the reality that, that we as scientists can't expect to be the experts any longer because these people have access. They're clever, just as clever, more clever than we are. And they've got all the access to all the information. And that's, they're just going to get it out there. So he spent five years of his life and produced this astonishing book. And, and we really have to acknowledge the depth of information in that book. I, I thought I would just like to introduce Annika Dahlquist as well, because Annika is a general practitioner in Stockholm. And about 2006, she was struggling with her own weight issues, and she discovered the low-carbohydrate diet. She went on it, she lost weight and all her other health parameters improved. So she decided, well, I better start prescribing it for my patients because it helped me. And, and she's allowed to do that because in medicine, personal experience and personal experience with your patients is also important information. So she got shot and the shooting of her produced an unexpected outcome. So she was banned from practicing medicine for prescribing the low carbohydrate diet which had been effective in her case, and despite all this evidence, she was banned from practicing in Stockholm, Sweden. But fortunately, she could brought broad action, I suspect, and a royal commission was established by the Swedish National Board of Health and Welfare, which is their major organization, like the Health Professionals Council. And they spent two years, and they looked through like 30,000 documents it was the most complete review of all the nutritional evidence as it relates to the management of type 2 diabetes. And their conclusion was low carb diets can today be seen as compatible with scientific evidence and best practice for weight reduction for patients with overweight or type 2 diabetes. A number of studies have shown effects in the short term and no evidence of harm has emerged. So I can give you all my evidence but they did a two-year study and looked at even more evidence, and that's their conclusion. And so we have to ask the question, this is 2008, and we're holding this hearing in 2016, eight years later. And that's what they would concluded. So the evidence that, that Harvard is changing its opinion is also shown in this uh, press release that they did a few, I think this was about 2000. 2014. And so it's fat and cholesterol out with the bad, in with the good. And this is what they say. Remember these Harvard scientists who've invested incredibly into the nutritional debate. Well, it's time to end the low-fat myth. The low-fat approach to eating may have made a difference for the occasional individual, but as a nation it hasn't helped us control weight or become healthier. In the 1960s, fats and oils supplied Americans with about 45% of their calories, and those are the data I showed you earlier. About 13% of adults were obese and under 1% had type 2 diabetes, a serious weight-related condition. Today, Americans take in less fat, getting about 33% of calories from fats and oils, yet 34% of adults are obese and 11% have diabetes, most with type 2 diabetes. So here they're finally getting off the bandwagon, and what was conventional advice is now becoming the non-conventional and incorrect, and that's the key. The ultimate measure is not whether it's a conventional or unconventional, it's whether it's right or whether it's wrong. And what's the quality of the evidence that supports it? So again, making the point that, that Harvard, who are considered the leading authorities on nutrition globally, are realizing we got it wrong. We, we're not actually going to show the next two video, well, videos, and because we haven't presented them, we, I can't give them, but essentially these are two videos of people even on the committee drawing up the new dietary guidelines saying we never promoted a low-fat diet. Six months after we released Real Meal Revolution, Time magazine finally got onto it and realized actually they maybe they've also been backing the wrong horse. And so they published this article and it's really interesting because they supported Keys. So I could have given you a cover with Ansel Keys. There's a famous 1984 Time cover saying that fat's killing us and we've got to eat less fat. But now in 2015, they come up with this. Label, scientists label fat the enemy, why they were wrong. And this is pure plagiarism, this article, because it's purely what Nina Teichold wrote in her book, Big Fat Surprise, which I've also discovered. 
And, and big fat surprise, at least one of the chapters is, or a couple of the chapters are given to you, and that's on 103.4. And uh, that's utterly an astonishing book, which we'll come back to it. So anyway, therefore, decades has been the most vilified nutrient in the American diet, but new science reveals fat isn't what's hurting our health. So again, decades. They acknowledge that conventional advice was there for decades, and it might be wrong. Then Dr. Sima Lotre in 2013 writes an article in the British Medical Journal, and it's titled, Saturated Fat is Not the Major Issue. And... Uh, I'm very proud to have written that editorial with him on that you can't outrun a bad diet, which exposed Coca-Cola and all those, all those shenanigans. And he said, indeed, recent prospective cohort studies have not supported any significant association between saturated fat intake and cardiovascular risk. Instead, saturated fat has been found to be protective. That's perhaps a slight over-exaggeration. But nevertheless, he has an article in the British Medical Journal and so if I was to read that article, I would say the convention is changing because this is a peer-reviewed article and it, this is my medical practice. Where do I get my inform Where does a doctor get the information from, from the British Medical Journal? And that's what it's saying. Now, Nina Teichold is really interesting because she's another person who does not have a medical training. She's a journalist. And she was a vegetarian and was struggling to survive and she was writing articles about food restaurants and so on. And eventually she started getting eat, eat more fat because that was all she was given. Her weight went down, various other medical conditions went down, and she'd said, hold on, I'm eating more fat and I'm getting thin. There's something wrong. There's a paradox. So here's a lady who didn't bind herself to convention. When she realized her own observations conflicted entirely with the guidelines, dietary advice, she said, I want to look into it. And she wrote this book, which is absolutely astonishing. Again, this is the book has to be read by every single doctor, if you want to consider yourself knowledgeable, by every single dietitian and nutritionist, if you want to think, understand the science of what are behind nutrition. She goes systematically through every single study that is used to support the low-fat diet, every single one, and this is what she discovers. The advice that comes out of this book is that a higher fat diet is almost assuredly healthier than one low, fat, low in fat and high in carbohydrates. There, I would argue there's no one in the world who understands the science of the low fat diet better than she does in terms of the science. So we've given you 4,000 pages of documentation. She went through every single study that is used to support the low fat diet, every single one, and she dissected it out. She discovered, for example, that when Ansel Keys was looking at the diets of the, of the people in Greece and was claiming that they were eating a low saturated fat diet, it turned out that he went there in Lent. And in Lent they don't eat. And he, and he, forgot, he forgot to announce that fasting is a key component of Greek, or Greek Orthodox people. And he didn't look, okay, who was fasting and who wasn't? And who were the, were the fastest, the ones who were, leave, live, were more healthy? That's the detail she went to. She went to absolutely everything. And it's all in that book. And it took 10 years of writing and incredible intensity to get that information. So then she says the most rigorous science now supports this statement. So her book is now reviewed, and it was one of the top sellers in, in America last year, and is ranked as one of the top really 10 medical books of the year and probably it's probably better than that. But Richard Smith, who's always been a thinker, he was editor of the British Medical Journal for many years, he reviews her book and the review is under Are Some Diets Mass Murder? Because that's how, for example, the low-carb diet's promoted. This is going to be mass murder. Everyone's going to die from it. So from low-fat to Atkins and beyond, diets that are based on pure nutrition science are a type of global uncontrolled experiment that may lead to bad outcomes, concludes Richard Smith. Now the question is, which diets is he looking about? Is he talking about the low-fat or is he talking about the Atkins or diets? And so he writes the following, and he says, The title, the subtitle, and the cover of this book are all demeaning. But the forensic demolition of the hypothesis that saturated fat is the cause of cardiovascular disease is impressive. Indeed, the book is deeply disturbing, and this is the component that 
that is really shocking when you read the book. The book is deeply disturbing in showing how over-enthusiastic scientists, poor science, massive conflicts of interest, and politically driven policymakers can make, make deeply damaging mistakes. Over 40 years, I've come to recognize what I might have known from the beginning, that science is a human activity with the error, self-deception, grandiosity, bias, self-interest, cruelty, fraud, and theft that is inherent in all human activities, together with some saintliness. saintliness. But this book shook me. And that's the key. You have to read the book. Because as you turn the page, you think, the science cannot get worse. And it gets worse on the next page. And it's because of all those things, the poor science, the massive conflict of interest, and the politically driven policymakers. Again, I emphasize that if we want to understand the poor science behind the dietary guidelines, we have to address and read that book. Now, more recently, Zoe Harcom, who I introduced yesterday in the concept of the obesogenic environment, she's a statistician, she's currently doing a PhD on this very question, but she also has training in nutrition, and she, for a PhD, is looking at what is the evidence for saturated fat causing heart disease from the clinical data that's been published, and her first paper which came out a week before she spoke in Cape Town at the Low Carb Conference last year. And she went and looked at all the evidence that had been accumulated in 1977 and 1983 when the dietary guidelines came out, 1977 in the the US, 1983 in the United Kingdom. So she's saying, let's take a step back. And if I was around in 1977 and the science came, like we've given you the science, And they said, okay, what's the evidence that saturated fat is unhealthy? Here it is. Let's look at it. So she analyzed it. And she came to this conclusion that recommendations were made for 276 million people in the United States, in Europe, and North America. Following secondary studies, people who had heart disease and then were put on diets, of 2,467 ill males, no females, not one female in the study, And they reported identical all-cause mortality. In other words, the intervention made no difference. The all-cause mortality, which is the key measurement, it's it's when you die that's important, and that's all-cause mortality. Whether you die of a heart attack or cancer, it doesn't matter. It's when you die. And that's all-cause mortality. And so what she's saying, that they had tiny studies of male subjects who were sick, and they intervened, they reduced their saturated fat intake, and nothing happened. And on that basis, we got these guidelines. So she concluded that the randomized controlled evidence did not support the introduction of dietary fat guidelines. So she's confirming exactly what Nina Teichold said, that in 1977, we put in place guidelines for which there was no scientific evidence. So again, the question conventional, the conventional interpretation or conventional guidelines had no evidence. And it's taken us 50 years to realize that the conventional was wrong and has caused harm.